Welcome to the Outer Realm with Michelle DeRoche and Amelia Pisano. Airing live on the United Public Radio Network, 105.3 FM in New Orleans. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday night segment of The Outer Realm. We are broadcasting live on the United Public Radio Network, UFO Paranormal Radio Network, 105.3, 107.7 FM from the beautiful city of New Orleans. We are fully sponsored by the amazing people over at Folgers Coffee who have been a part of our journey since the very beginning. So thank you, Folgers. It would not be the same without you. Also, big thank you to Dr. Snick, the sonic surgeon, a.k.a. Justin Snicker, for the contribution of his time, his music, and his voice for our intro that you just heard. He's an award-winning composer of Halloween horror, sci-fi, and dark wave electronic music, which can't be found on all of your favorite music streaming platforms. Also, big thank you to Steve McGinnis, the artist behind the banners and the logos here at the show. Check him out on Facebook and Instagram. He also specializes in the horror genre and does unbelievable commission pieces. So tonight, I am flying solo, as you can see. Um, Bubbles uh, is not with me, probably for this week. Uh, Her daughter had to have a biopsy on her kidney, so the family's just going through a little bit of a roller coaster ride right now. So let's just send them lots of well wishes, love and big hugs. And uh, hopefully everything goes status quo, which would be nice. Uh, Tonight, we welcome for the very first time, Dr. Arlen Andrews Sr., who's going to be discussing his latest book. Let's see, let's try not to butcher this. Kia Rumiak, The Lost Secrets of the Shadow Machine. And it's based on his trips to the sacred valley of Peru, which led to the discovery and analysis of an ancient solar calendar, to which, of course, he reveals in his book. So I'm really looking forward to all of that. That's something completely, you know, different. We know we like to talk about ancient discoveries and things like that here on the show. So I'm, you know, again, pretty excited. So we're just waiting for him to chime on in. And in the meantime... Tamara. Hello, Tamara. Sending hugs to Bubbles. Yeah, hopefully she'll be able to, you know, sneak in into the chat room. And hey, Chris. Hey, Chris. No Amelia tonight, unfortunately. But hopefully, you know, we'll be she'll be back soon. Um, oh, and without further ado, our guest is here, so we can just hop right on board. And anybody having questions, please remember there are eight different chat rooms tonight. So it's like a super highway that comes down to one lane. If we don't get to any questions or comments uh, right away, just know that there are are other ones coming in. And also remember that we'd like to keep up with the guest. So it's not going to be, you know, all about what we want. (laughs) This isn't a Q and a guys. It's not a Q and a, Yes, Chris, love ancient history, love anything to do with it. It's just fascinating. And this is so much that's been missed or that's been kept hidden or that simply hasn't been discovered. And we need somebody like Dr. Andrews to come in and say, well, I discovered something. So without further ado, talk to Arlen Andrews. Hello and welcome. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for having me on. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure is mine. (laughs) Been looking forward to it. Um, it's just fascinating. Uh, so I like to start off with, I guess, your know, humble beginnings. I like. I want to give you the floor because we our show typically gets probably about between two and a half and three million people a night, uh, live listeners. Uh, a good chunk of that is audio because we're an FM channel as well. So I want to make sure we get absolutely as much as possible out. Um, that you would like to have get out. So where would you like to start? How did you come across this discovery? Um, just on a random trip to Peru? Or is this something that you make a habit of doing, discovering amazing things? 
<laughs> well, I was, in, I was in Peru in uh, April of 2012. I went there to look at a stone that I had written articles about, but I had not visited, uh, a place called the Soweti Stone, which would be the topic of a, another whole program. Right. But I <laughs> you was, can do it. <laughs> I was on the way with my son, the doctor, the medical doctor, Ed, Sean Andrews, our guide was Brian Forster, who's quite well known in uh, the travel and ancient places. Uh, he's got a the ancient, or what is it called, the Hidden Eco Channel on YouTube. Nice. And, and the visits I'm going to talk about are on those on that channel. Okay. Uh, there's a there's a program he has called Did the Ancient Eco Have a Clock? And that shows the uh, first trip we took to that place of Kiarobiak. On April the tenth of twenty twelve, and okay. you'll see me there about twenty pounds lighter. I right. mean heavier, heavier <laughs> than. Okay, we were on our way to Sawadee Stone, and we went through this little village. On the way, about thirty miles north of uh, Cusco, Peru, and we saw a, a sign, a kind of a crude sign, showing an arch, and it says Kiarobiak. And okay. uh, well, let's go back tomorrow and look at that. So. We did. The next day we went back. And uh, so you see, you put a picture up of the book that I wrote about it. Yes. I, I almost became obsessed with this site because, let's see, we're mostly on radio, but for your TV people, I can show a picture. Maybe I should, yeah, I can show a picture of uh, oh. what, the site, what the site looks like if you want to go on, on Google Earth. And uh, you can look up the site of Kia Rubiak. Beautiful. And, and you can see uh, <clears throat> a drone shot of it below. Okay. May I show that photo? One second. Yes. I, I, I went to your, you can find um, Dr. Andrews on Facebook, and he has some of these pictures. And this is where I borrowed them from. So here we go. Okay. There. Wonderful. Okay. Perfect. Nice <clears throat> Shot. Okay, and now what is this we're looking at exactly? Okay, right here, that's a waterfall. There's a uh, there was an ancient site built there. Okay. Uh, the calendar we're going to talk about was part of it. <coughs> Excuse me, my, my allergies. Oh, uh, sorry. There was there are megalithic ruins there right now. There used to be some sort of building made with big, beautiful megalithic rocks that are all scattered around. Uh, there's a waterfall, and there are steps, wet steps, dangerous wet steps. You walk up. And you come to this beautiful carving in the side of the hill. There's a huge outcrop of limestone, about 60, 80 feet wide and about 40 or 50 feet high. And into it is carved something that looks like an inverted horseshoe or an inverted crescent moon. Okay, it's go. a sculpture that's about nine feet wide. There, there we go. Nine feet wide, four feet high, and two feet deep. And uh, while Sh Sean and Brian were looking at other things, I was fascinated by this. So I sat on a stone about 25 feet due east of that and looked at it for a couple of hours. Hmm. Well, first off, I said, this is elegant. This is beautiful. It is. Uh, it is. I said, no, it looks like the center of it is a parabola. And what fascinated me as an engineer and somebody interested in ancient civilizations is Nothing parabolic has ever shown up on any other architecture in the New World. Mm -hmm. A parabola typically means solar related. It's related to the sun in some fashion. Right. So I said, this looks like a sundial. And these little marks you see around the edges of it, for those who are listening on radio, there are dark marks. Uh, let's see, eight dark marks around the side of it that look like the... Uh, the markings on a watch, a wristwatch, you would have an analog wristwatch. Yes. So it's, somebody went to a lot of trouble to carve this, uh, this sculpture. It's very precise. And, uh, well, it's the, the innermost arc there of the parabola. Mm -hmm. It's very precise. It's very, very sharp, even to the touch right now. Wow. The uh, locations of the markings on the side are precise. But if you look at it from a distance, like this photograph shows, it looks like it's nice and smooth and somebody said melted by a laser. No, it's not. If you get up close to it and crawl around in it like I did, 
Mm-hmm. You, you will see it was chipped by hand and maybe wow. some sort of chisels, thousands and thousands of chisel marks. And if you look at it in detail and take measurements of everything, you'll see that it's only as precise as it has to be. Now, right. I'm an engineer. And I looked at this. I watched the shadows move. And I said, this is a sundial of some sort. So I'm going to go back to Cusco tonight and get online and find out all the books that have been written about it because, you know, this is great. I, right. I want to know. Right. So I got back to Cusco that night. I spent hours on the computer. And there was almost nothing about it. There were only... Uh, there was one government document that said it's there. This is the name of it. Kia Rubiac. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kia meaning moon and ruby meaning uh, stone and yak meaning belonging to. So the stone of the moon. Wow. And that's it. And uh, I was shocked. So I uh, hired Brian to go back out and take a lot of measurements over the next five years, really. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot of that's a lot of uh, information to gather. I decided, you know, this is ridiculous. Somebody really needs to analyze this thing. So I'll tell you now. I'll preface everything with saying that I made a discovery that nobody else has made. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, right. but I I also analyzed it in a way that nobody else has ever used. Right. And I'll show you, I'll show you that. Let's see. I hate to. Uh, not tell the people, be able to show the people on radio, but you'll see a photograph here. Yes. The sculpture. Oh, wow. Yes. It's embedded in the big stone. And then the rock I was sitting on, I call it shaman stone. And I think that the carving was made there because that stone was a right uh, vantage point that you could look at it. Yes. So the uh, sculpture is only meant to be looked at from a distance like you like the photograph you showed right so to me as an engineer i looked at it i said okay i'm going to share this up to give people a scope of the size of it if you don't mind sure there also from dr andrew's facebook page so there this is go. this this is to scale pretty much like it's not this right, big, yeah. gigantic no it's not. looking thing just to reiterate to those who are listening and not and not um watching it's about it's about eight feet off the ground, so it can't be touched. It can't be touched unless you climb up to it, and I did. It is dangerous, <laughs> and right. I wasn't I wasn't supposed to be there either. Oh, <laughs> as an engineer, as an engineer, I was uh, surprised and somewhat aggravated that it had not been analyzed because I wanted to read all about it. Right. So I said, well, "I'm going to have to do it myself." Right. So it, it might be a discovery that I've made, which kind of thrilled me. I said, wow, it'd be great to make a discovery. Oh, so yeah. I took I took the uh, the initial uh, measurements that Brian had made and I made a fairly crude 3D CAD model, computer-aided design model mm-hmm. on a program. Mm-hmm. And I using that, it. using that, I made predictions about what the shadows should look like at different times of the year. And it looked to me like the shadows would indicate the solstices and the equinoxes of the oh, year. Oh, wow. Look at that. And yeah. uh, so these were crude. Right. So Brian, Brian went back out there based on my prediction. He went back out there on the solstice of June the 20th or 21st of 2012 and photographed it and got the, the, the uh, shadows exactly like my model showed. So I said, wow. this, is pretty, this is pretty good. I have a crude approximate model, yet it predicted where the shadows are going to be. Mm-hmm. Now, why would anybody want to know the equinoxes and the solstices? Mm-hmm. An agricultural-based society needs to know when to plant and when to harvest. That's they need true. to know when the year begins and when the year ends and probably right. all the months in between. Yes. So it, an agricultural society, this is a matter of life or death. If you don't get the crops in, you starve to death. I mean, that's right. Yeah. Well, Very unforgiving. <laughs> so along the way, then, as new information came in, I made, I made better models like this. Mm-hmm. Wow. I'm, what I'm showing you for the people on the radio is a, a better model of the system. 
Now, it was only approximate because uh, he couldn't get every angle and every dimension properly done. And it, there's a curvature to it that I wasn't able to put in. Right. But crudely, it showed what I wanted. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I, uh, this was a solstice model or photograph that he took. And the shadow there, the vertical shadow in the center, right. underneath it, that one marking shows the shadow at the solstice. Right. And the uh, shadow coming down overhead, when mm -hmm. it touches the outer ring, tells the onlooker, the watcher, yes. okay, this is the day. Right. Now, another thing we noticed, I took a lot of pictures that first day, and I noticed in this photograph... There was a time of day when there was a, let's see, right here. Okay. I'm sure, for the radio people, I'm showing that there's a hole in the rock and the sun shines through at a certain time of day onto a certain spot. Right. Now, the uh, I put that in my computer model and the computer model showed the same thing. Oh, fascinating. Now the uh, that's pretty good predicting that. Look at that. The the point is, you couldn't see it from that stone. The watcher of that stone could not see that sun shining through of the day I was there. Right. You had to be underneath it to see. So I wondered when yeah. it was and it would show up. Well, it turned out that on the day of the solstice, in addition to the shadows coming vertical and overhead, at the same time, the sun shone through that same hole. So all these things happen at the same time. Excuse me. Of course. So the uh, mm -hmm. all these indicators, there, there are several other indicators, too detailed to get into here, but it has to do with shadows. Right. Uh, there, there are five different indicators that occur within a few minutes of each other mm -hmm. on the day of the solstice. Right. Now, the watcher, the person who watched Ica stuff, if this is Ica, mm -hmm. the watcher is called a Yanka. And... Uh, the Yankas were assigned to many villages and other places to look up at other shadow phenomena. Right. And they would say, okay, this is the time. This is the day. It's end of the year, beginning of the year. Time to plant, time to harvest, whatever. And maybe there were some uh, ritual t dates too. I mean, you use calendars for more than one thing. Right. And so somebody in the ancient times had figured out how to do this. Mm -hmm. So as an engineer, I was just totally fascinated by it. So it took lots of hundreds of pictures and hundreds of measurements. Uh, an interesting thing we found out, and I'm, for the radio people, I'm showing a vertical, the first picture ever taken from the top of this monument looking down, sculpture looking down. Wow. If you extend, if you extend mm -hmm. line from each of those markings, yes. they all converge at one spot. They do, yes. Now, yes. what does that mean? Well, my 3D model showed that the, uh, yes. if you look at overhead, they come together. But if you look at it in three dimensions, they all converge on one, right one center pole. Yes. Yes. And so it's like a, again, a, similar to a sundial, just on a much bigger scale. And uh, it's a sundial, but it is, it is unique. Yes. As, as I can tell in all of history because it has no pointer. There's no nomon, no pole sticking in the middle that casts yeah. a shadow. The right. shadows are cast by the carved par parabolic inner circle yeah. there. It's curvature. And right. So I went back in 2017 with right. my brother, this time my late brother, and I went up there on it and I confirmed wow. those things do converge like that. Fascinating. Now, now, funny thing was, I was up there about 20 minutes, and then I'm just about through. I had about three or four more measurements to make, and I start be hearing a guy yell at me in Spanish, you know, get the hell down off of that. Yeah, you're not supposed to be there, you rebel. Well, I, <laughs> my brother offered him, my bro, excuse me, my brother offered him a you know, hundred souls, a dollar and a half to let me stay, but no, 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 get down. I just wish I had increased the uh, offer. So for another 10 minutes, but nevertheless, I was able to get a lot of dimensions. 
And for those who are interested, I have the, the curvature or the uh, orientation. Wow. Of every, every one of those angles. Very now, well done. It's very you. difficult yeah. to say that it's crude. It's actually very detailed. Well, mm -hmm. I, uh, for those of you who are listening and didn't see the book, I wrote a book, which is available, of course, on Amazon and the other channels, right, called, back called up again. Kia Rubiak, Kia Rubiak, yeah. Lost Secrets of the Shadow Machine. Okay, now, I call, it, I call it a machine, a shadow machine, because a machine is something that gives a an output based on information you put into it. And it's right. always, it's basically mechanical. It's straightforward. And this does that. If right. you put it, you, if you go on your computer program, you put in a certain date and time, it will show you where the shadows are going to be. Hmm. Now, I'm, uh, my, my results are approximate. What I really would like to have done, if somebody would do it, the government or some agency would go in and do a laser scan of that entire face Mm -hmm. You get a perfect 3D model of the thing. Mm -hmm. Then we could see exactly what's going on. There, there might be a lot more uh, functions of this thing than what I came across. Right. But I was pretty happy that the uh, the crude models or the approximate models I had <clears throat> were able to predict what was going to happen. And the photographs at those times showed that it did happen. Right, right. Now, <clears throat> this is a discovery. But like I said, as far as I know, nobody has ever used a modern computer aided design software mm -hmm. to analyze the shadows of an ancient artifact. Well, so no, this, no, I, I, this, I, you nailed it. I, I don't think anybody would even have figured it out remotely. And uh, now in the book, the reason I mentioned the book, I want to get this in front of real archeologists and other engineers and people. I would like people to go out and take these measurements and take pictures of shadows every day it would be great to have a, a cam out there, a webcam, you know, a trail cam to right. video the whole thing. But yes, that's not going to happen. But the three D uh, scan of the entire face would give us a perfect representation of it. So LIDAR, then, basically, like he said. Then, yeah. Then we could uh, right. analyze everything. Now, because I'm an engineer, I like to share information. Every measurement that we took mm -hmm. is in my book. I invite anybody who wants to, to please take the information we have, realize that it's only approximate, <clears throat> build your own 3D models of it, mm -hmm. see if you can discover other things. Right. Now, I the shadows are there. I went back in 2017 with my, like I said, my late brother Roy, and we were there uh, for off and on for four days. During the June solstice, there's a thing called the solar standstill, the... Uh, the sun at solar noon those days is about in the same spot for just about four days. Mm -hmm. In fact, down in Peru today, they still have the uh, celebration. They call it Inti Rami, the celebration of the sun. Right. It's, a, it's a four day party. Nice. I believe it goes on 24 hours a day and it's loud and noisy and drunken and fun. <laughs> and we, we participated in some of that. Right. It was, it was great. Right. What I would like, what I want to know, put forward, is I want the people of Peru to realize that their ancestors, Ica or maybe before, mm -hmm. built this thing. It's a work of genius. Yes. It's not anything like it in the whole world, in all of history that I can find. I was going to ask you if, if there were any similar structures anywhere else in the world, if you were able well, to find anything. There might be, but nothing that I could find online right. or in any professional uh, publication or anything. Right, right, uh, right. I, I, somebody asked me that again today on another subject, and I said, yeah, I really hope that they could find it. Now, I did find that the Inca, whoever it was, in about the year 1500s, before the Spaniards came in and destroyed everything, the Inca put out a proclamation to the calendars were to be built all over the tons to not right. use the, the kingdom. Right. Now, I thought, well, good. When I read that, maybe there are other ones like this, but nothing I could find anywhere in Peru or anywhere else was ever built like this. Now, if you, took, if you took the same cylinder or calendar rather and moved it 50 miles, it wouldn't mm -hmm. work the same. Mm -hmm. It's only good for, I don't know how far, probably only a mile or so in each direction. Yes. Now, 
I don't know how many people on the radio are going to understand all this, but basically you have a thing, like I said, about eight, nine feet wide, four feet high, two feet deep, a parabolic curve in the middle of it. And that curve defines a shadow that defines a vertical shadow, depending on where the sun is. Right. Then there are overhead stones that are also carved <coughs> that pursue, produce a horizontal shadow that comes down and touches the outer ring of a of another uh, parabola, parabola right. in the middle. Right. And what that, what that does, that tells the yonka, the onlooker, the watcher, okay, this is the time. And mm -hmm. uh, when that happens, the... Uh, other things could occur too. There, there's a crack in the bottom of the floor. There, there's not a hole to put a stone. I mean, a rod in for a shadow, but okay. there is a a crack that like it has been a natural crack mm -hmm. that came across. It was enlarged smoothly, right. which to me like they could have put a a shadow bowl, I mean, a bowl of uh, water in there, and at a certain time of year, get a reflection off of that water onto the side. Now, that would yeah, was, that would make sense. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was so involved in so many other things. I didn't have time to go ahead and, and look at that possibility. Now, what I did do, the shadows are there. That, that can't be argued with. Those mm -hmm. are facts. Now, I did speculate about other things. And okay. I did, in the book, I identified it. In the book, I identified what the facts are about the shadows, about the fact the five or so shadow functions that occur on the solstice, mm -hmm. all the, within a few minutes of each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I speculate on some other shadows and some other functions. Right. All that, that's defined in there. There's facts are in one spot, and I, I defy anybody to argue with them because you go down there, and the shadow is going to be there whether you agree right. or not. <laughs> right. And, uh, right. Now, another thing that occurred when I was looking at all the photographs that Brian had taken, I started looking at them quite quickly, and I noticed something that it looked like a figure was moving down the face of this huge rock. Hmm. Now, if you look at this right here, kind of squint your eyes. Mm -hmm. What does that shadow remind you of? Okay, well, I'm showing it for people on radio. I'm showing this big shadow that comes down over the top of the sculpture. Okay. And oops, yeah, here we go. And this okay. is what looks like to me right it looked right. like the shadow of the condor which is a holy bird the sacred bird of the Indian cultures right and you identify the eye the crest the tail the upswept wings yes yes yeah, and, yeah I see it yeah as, as far as I know nobody else has ever pointed this out now I'm looking at some other photographs that people have taken for me mm -hmm. during the year and the shadow might appear more than just the solstice. It might appear during other times of the year. I don't know. We really right. need to. Uh, yes. The complexity of that curved uh, surrounding rock is such that I was not able to model it. I mean, uh, you really have to do a laser scan to model it. Right. But it looks like, now, the condor, like I said, all Indian cultures uh, revere the condor. Condor. The shadow. Yeah, North American the would be Thunderbird. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. The condor shadow appears at Oyante Tambo and some other places in the Sacred Valley. Okay. Now, another thing I picked out, and this is a, has to be uh, looked at in detail. I'm speculating here. Oh. And these that was June, in December, six months later, during that solstice, mm -hmm. it appears that the shadow of a uh, cougar, yes, a puma, yes. is there in the opposite direction. Yes. Now, I have read from other speculative authors that the way Machu Picchu is laid out, that the shadows of it represent a, a condor one part of the year and a, and a puma the other part of the year six months later. Right. And that such uh, a pairing of shadows like that in opposite directions is common throughout the uh, Sacred Valley. Mm -hmm. now, I'll, leave, I'll leave it up. It's fascinating that... that that's see that to me is very precise detail to have a carving as such where when a shadow hits it you can pretty much see what it is that's genius yeah. 
they were. Now, as an engineer, of course, I was trying to figure out how did they make this thing. And, uh, of course, me, I'm thinking, well, oh, drafting board and drawings and yeah. equations and everything else. And my wife looked at it. She said, no, hun. <laughs> she said, if I was doing it, I would make a, a full-scale clay model of the thing, fire it, a ter terracotta model, maybe. Right. And put it up next to where I wanted it to be made. And I would tweak that clay model until the shadows did what I wanted them to do. And only then the guys take the measurements and go over and chip it to the rock. I said, of course, her. she's a better engineer than I was, you know. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a lot easier to correct mistake in yeah. a mud bottle than it is for stone. Yes, absolutely. Now, when I put this, first put the photographs of this out, and then Brian did it also back in 2012, uh, we had all these new age people. Forgive me, I, I like new age people. I'm good myself, but I don't like the instant salvation, instant gratification that a lot of people get by saying, oh, it's aliens or it's ancient. Right. <laughs> if, if you're Logical new age, maybe? <laughs> if, if you do, if you say it was magic or psychic powers or aliens, mm -hmm. you have to stop right there. Your brain stops. There's nothing you can do with it. Okay, that's right. it. Right. But if you're an engineer, a double engineer like me, I said, well, you know, I want to know how this worked. People... Right. People worked on this thing. In my estimation, it took four people probably a year to 18 months to make this. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to spend this time and money and food and everything else for something that uh, it's, it's like that. I mean, you need to respect the ancients. You might not, they might not have been accurate about everything, but they were darn sure good about some things. Right. So right. in this case, uh, I, in the book, I show detailed working up close, reproduce a two square inch thing. And you can see hundreds and hundreds of marks. They had some kind of chisels. In a few places, it looked like they had great big chisels. And I don't know what those tools were. Mm -hmm. But uh, in many cases, it was just stones. They picked mm -hmm. out stones. And I, I hate the thought of working on a, a big limestone uh, rock like that to make a, like you say, a precise model. I mm -hmm. mean... The first guys to look at that say, oh, my God, really? Hey, boss, you really want us to do this? Uh, well, you, you, almost, you have to dissect it to to understand it. Um, just while we're on that topic, what type of stone is it? Uh, my, limestone. It is limestone. And also wondering, is there an aquifer underneath the structure? Uh, there. That you know of. That government... That government pamphlet that I mentioned said that they, there was a, uh, they had ex done some excavations and they had found a, uh, an aquifer underneath. Right. Uh, well, I'm sorry, not an aquifer, but called French drain, I guess you would say. Right. Yeah, this is the, this is the document I'm showing on the, for the radio listeners. I'm showing you the one document that the Peruvian government put out about, about the archaeological site. It mostly talks about the site and not not the sculpture itself. The site is, uh, you know, a hundred acres and it's got a cave. So it's protected, it. basically. Yeah, it it's is a protected area. Right. But people ask, well, what happened to all the stone that was chipped out? And I said, like I said, it could have gone down to the bottom, and they made a French drain out of it. Because right. uh, twenty feet behind you, behind the shaman stone, is that that stream, and right. then the waterfall goes down, and the waterfall goes next to where the uh, the building had been. Mm -hmm. So my take is that more than likely they had one person because that stone is only good for one or two people to sit on. Right. And uh, different times of the year, he, and then there always was a he, would be out there looking for something. And uh, he's, okay, it's close. Okay, today's the day. And he would go down and tell the people and the, uh, the priests or the workers in that building, okay, mm -hmm. now we can tell the folks this year has begun. The year is ended, or it's time to plant, or it's time for the celebration, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But those markings on there are permanent markings. The way the uh, thing is laid out, the uh, there's always a triangular shadow mm -hmm. every time of day between the two, the, between the different what I call wedges on the side here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, it still works. You can still right. go there. 
and it still works. And I did did take videos uh, when we were there in 2017, and uh, it was exciting at that time because I wasn't sure. I mean, the, the still photographs show one thing, but to see it in actual motion was was very very That's pleasing. That's a whole other thing. Yes. And, uh, and as far as I know, we were the first people ever to point that out and photograph it. So, so is there any real idea as to who built it? Who constructed well, this? The uh, in my book timeline on it. Yeah, in my book, I put down every quote that I could find in the archaeological literature about the site. Right, and it, it only takes about three pages. And typically, right. they say. It's there. It's the moon. It's probably a feminine uh, idol of some sort. Feminine ceremonies take place here. That's it. Right. One one Cuban archaeologist was there, and he said hmm. it might be astronomical, but he didn't do anything with it. Hmm. And then uh, somebody else said, "Well, there's no mention of it by the Spaniards. In fact, there was no mention of it anywhere." Oh, for the modern times. I mean, the, when conquistadors ravaged the country, they usually made notes about what they tore up, you know, yes. but yes. there were no notes about this at all. So it's, I, oh, I don't that's know. That's interesting. Now it, it's been out there at least since the Inca, which would be at least 500 years. Right. The Inca were only there for 100, 150 years. Right. And other cultures were there thousands of years before. So. Right. Right. If you, if you look at it, it doesn't seem to have been weathered that much. Like I said, that inner parabola, Mm -hmm. parabolic uh, arc yes. it's still sharp to the touch the surfaces were never really smooth they appear smooth from a distance but up closer not but they don't so, appear to be that that weathered now if you go to Cusco and you look at some stones around Soxway Mon or some of those places or you have Tutambo right. uh, Valley, those stones have been weathered you can tell they're smooth edged they've been uh, around they, a while <laughs> right. now, this, this one like I said can't be touched unless you climb to it so nobody ever rubbed on it or anything Yes. So I went, I saw some person without any evidence at all just a couple of days ago, like you on the Facebook about it or YouTube or someplace. She said, Oh, it's 3,000 years old. I'd like to know how you got that. It would be I, weathered, right? For sure. I tried to, uh, using that sun shining on that spot at a certain time, mm -hmm. I tried to run the, the calendar. The program I had takes a calendar back. 4,000 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was trying, but I don't have the exact measurements of the whole, exact position of the whole. Mm -hmm. But I imagine you could look at that and see during the solstice mm -hmm. where the whole uh, shines through, the sun shines through at a certain spot. Right. To get that, to get that, it has to be exact orientation. Mm -hmm. Now, I did go back about 2,000 years and uh, with my crude model it looked like it was still working 2000 years ago. Okay. But I, but I can't, I have no confidence in that that's just, that's be, an, be an artifact of the, of the program or by inaccurate measurements. That's well, why we need somebody to go there. Yes. Really measure the whole thing and mm -hmm. see right. if they did that, they'd probably tell. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting because if, you know, if it looks like it could have been functioning, but yet it's not weathered, like it just opens up a whole other series of questions. Um, have you? Did you ever observe it in the moonlight? Uh, everybody asked it. That's no. First off, the place is closed, and secondly, it would be dangerous to be around there in the moonlight because you could fall off. Right. You could no, fall but it would off. be interesting setting up cameras, like you say, maybe trap cameras, to, yeah. to to observe it doing different things at different times of the year, different times of the day or night. Well. If, if it has anything to do with the moon, I'd be surprised because. Right. Uh, right. Uh, and and I, I'll leave that, like I said in the book, I'll leave that as an exercise yeah. for the reader, for the there student. <laughs> Somebody's, I mean, because the moon is a different place in my God to go back hundreds of years. And the moon is all over yes. the place. But the sun is exactly the same spot. Uh, I went back 3,000 years on there, and uh, the sun was in the perfect spot for 3,000 years. The Earth hasn't moved very much in 3,000 years. No, surprisingly. <laughs> uh, it hasn't tilted much. There, you know, someday, 10 or 15,000 years, it'll, it'll, it will tilt. Right. And people have asked about the orientation of the feet of this thing, but at the bottom of it, for the radio listener, 
the bottom of this arch, mm -hmm. there are vertical feet. Hmm. And uh, again, during the solstice, one of those feet goes into shadow and the other goes into sunlight immediately. There's at all these other shadows having. So, like mm -hmm. I said, all these, these things can't be coincidence with all these things no. going on. No, I don't believe in so coincidence. No. They're, the entire sculpture is oriented at 12 or 13 degrees east of north. Mm -hmm. Now, the engineer, I would think, oh, north and south is exactly what I want, but this is tilted 13 degrees. And mm -hmm. that's another thing I leave up to the, uh, to the reader or the student to calculate. I don't know if it's because it's 13 degrees south of the equator mm -hmm. that that's tilted 13 degrees, or if there's another reason, or mm -hmm. maybe it's to do with the rock that they had available. So mm -hmm. I, I imagine when somebody wanted to do this, they, they saw this great big rock out there, the big flat face. Right. They said, we could carve something in there. We got this big shaman stone sitting over here 25 feet away. We could sit on that and look directly and make our calendar there. And uh, one thing we forgot to mention to everybody on radio is this thing is tilted back about 45 degrees. It's not vertical or horizontal. It's tilted back into the rock about 45 degrees. Okay, that's good to know. And uh, so, again, the uniqueness of it is it's got that parabola in the middle that defines the shadow. Mm -hmm. tells you what time it is. It's got the overhead rocks that have been carved to give you an overhead indicator to say, okay, do your reading now. Mm -hmm. And it's... Uh, it's tilted at 45 degrees with with no rod to give a, a, a shadow. So all these things make it unique. And uh, mm -hmm. to me now, the milling of it is not that big a deal. I'll have to give my wife credit for coming up with that. But <laughs> to me, the, con the concept of it, the person or persons who thought of this, mm -hmm. who in the world would ever think of such a thing? I mean, right. So I, I enjoy definitely things. Definitely human. Yes. In your perspective, do you think these are made by human hands? Or? Oh, yeah. No, okay. Yeah, I have in, to in ask the, because you know how the hubbub about the period. Yeah, oh, well, that, that, was part of, that was part of my, uh, the crap I had to put up with when I first showed the pictures of it back in 2012. Yeah. Oh, it's melted in the stone. No, it's not. Oh, it was made by aliens. What proof of that? Again, if you say, <laughs> right. if you say, if you say aliens, you got to quit. There's no way to analyze it. Just drop it. Yeah. I mean, in my estimation, I know people are going to argue with me. Mm -hmm. My estimation, there's no evidence whatsoever, zero zilch, that any alien ever built anything on Earth. It was all done by ancient people, mm -hmm. uh, smart people, engineers, artisans, architects, mm -hmm. sculptors, people working with heads. And to say that it was done by magic or aliens is an insult. And right. actually... I don't want to get into it too too deep. Oh, it's, it's okay. Our audience is completely <laughs> wide open to everything. Actually, it all it all goes. <laughs> actually, to me, it's culturalist and racist. Okay, interesting. To do that, okay. These people, say these little brown people in the Andes couldn't have come up with this thing. Uh, the yeah. Suwedi stone, the Suwedi stone, thirty miles from this one, is another piece of genius. Yes. That has a real lost technology built into it that I'll talk about another time. Right. I mean, lost technology you can identify it. it's there it's been there hundreds or thousands of years right so uh and my friend chris nunn can, of course can tell you all about the stuff that we saw in egypt and that he's still reporting oh, about egypt it. yeah I've and been... writing about egypt. Yes. and when, when people say and there's a very famous person interested in these things he writes a lot about it i respect all the work he's done up until one paragraph in one book he said uh, I don't believe any of these things were done by mechanical means. They were done by mind power or psychic means. So, oh, God. Right. Give, give me one piece of evidence. I mean, if you if you build up to it and right. say, I've got evidence that shows that, I'll listen, you know. If I've got time, I'll listen to it. Right. But Show me without, your work. <laughs> without without yeah. evidence. And that's it. If I work here, yeah. every measurement we took, uh, Every dimension we took, every angle we took, everything is in this book. And I invite other people, like I said, to build their own models. Mm -hmm. Go try it out because they might find things I overlooked. In fact, there, there will be. There's there's a lot more to it than what I was able to find. It's all about mathematics, right? I mean, at the end of the day. It's, uh, yeah, in the book I show how uh, different parabolas describe uh, the uh, 
the inner workings of the layout and everything. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence, you know, that the Inca or the other Indian tribes had their cultures had advanced mathematics or geometry. I don't know. Uh, well, ancient cultures follow the stars. The ancient cultures, uh, I, I think, and here's a perfect comment. Um, genius like this happens when the population is not dumbed down by media or tech addictions. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think um, you have a community that, uh, that worked together, you know, I mean, some of the, the best scholars came out of ancient times. I was in Egypt one time with Chris Dunn and others, and uh, a lady was giving us a tour of the West Bank. And I saw a young boy about 15 years old herding a bunch of uh, sheep and goats across mm. the street. And I said, how come this kid's not in school? It's school time. She <laughs> said, oh, she said, oh, no, the uh, uh, people in the West Bank raise our food. Uh, they don't go beyond eighth, eighth grade, eighth form. Uh, <laughs> I said, you realize this kid right there might be the smartest person who ever lived? You're not giving him an education. You're making him raise goats. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just the way it is. On East Bank, we are, uh, she was basically saying, on East Bank, we're superior. We get master's degrees and everything. And on the West Bank, they'd raise our food. Wow. Thought, oh, my God. And uh, so uh, this, kind of, this kind of racism, culturalism, and arrogance. Uh, it's a tough world, in, Arlen. It's a tough world. <laughs> in Egypt as well as, as here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I've been. It's just, it's a very, very cut and dry mix, you know, sadly. Well, yeah, the guy named Rachmanajan uh, for India was a self-educated guy. Right. If you read it about him, you know, and he had mathematics that nobody else in the world did. So, I, I, you know. Yes. Brains, yeah. brains are packaged in different ways, but they can be great no matter where they are. I agree with you. Um, now, what, what I want to see out of this, besides getting credit for being a discoverer, of course, I am that much of an egotist, of course. <laughs> Who is it? It's okay. They, Pat is the, up on the back. <laughs> well, why not? I yeah, mean, exactly. People, That's what I say. <laughs> I mean, my friend Chris Dunn looked at pyramids and sculptures in Egypt and saw things that nobody else had ever seen. Right. All the millions of people had been there, and nobody else ever saw what he saw. Now, he was my inspiration for this. My mind is not in the same league with that, of course, but it is right. different. What I would like to see is that this thing be made a World Heritage Site. So that little village, uh, San Martin de Porres, next to it, next to it, which is dirt poor, Aww. but it becomes a tourist attraction. Now it's funny. We were there in 2012, and the crude sign that we went back the next day and drove out there on this rough road, had to stop and uh, hike about a quarter mile up to this site and everything. And all I had was a sign: "Don't get up here. You're know, not prohibited." Yeah. But that that was all. There was nothing. Mm -hmm. So in 25 years later, in 2017, we go back. Wow, next to the highway is a great big sign. Beautifully done. Oh. Archaeological site. So we drive up there, and now there's a rope across and a gate across the road. And there's a visitor center. And you go inside, they have models of it and everything else. They don't pay much attention to the sculpture, but the, the entire archaeological site. And you have to pay money to go right. to it. I said, well, that's great. Five that's years. They start. Yeah. I'm sure the road is going to be great. We got in there, the road was worse. Oh. They had not maintained the road at all. And uh, we had to hike. This time I had 30 pounds of equipment with me, and my brother had a bunch of stuff. And we had to tote all this stuff up those wet stairs and around. Mm -hmm. and, uh, right. Not improve the site at all, but at least they had right. paid some attention to it. The funny thing was we were getting ready to leave, and we, we took a road back behind it. And as we were walking by, I was complaining about the upkeep of the thing. And at that moment, the road gave way underneath me. And I started falling down the hillside uh, about 50 feet. And uh, if I had gone much further, there was about a 20-foot drop-off there. So I had to just start running myself to get myself back in balance and not fall off the edge. And I said, well, that's the last time I'll complain about anything where anybody can hear me. You know? Right. I complained about <laughs> And uh, we wanted to go out there at, at daybreak, but it didn't open then. And also, it's dangerous to be around the site in the dark. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in fact, the State Department keeps giving out these 
warnings about Peru anywhere anymore about crime. They've had so many illegals come across from Venezuela and other places that there are daylight okay. robberies. I, okay. I can't speak to that. I'm not there, but I, I, I keep yeah. getting these State Department warnings because I wonder their list. But of, proceed with caution, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Yeah. Go out. Don't go alone. Don't go alone. In fact, don't don't go to Cusco alone. Uh, right. Always have somebody with you. Yeah, I had a wow. friend, a friend who was mugged there mm -hmm. years ago, and uh, it still happens. But oh, not not going to get any easier. Um, I think to 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 turn this into a World Heritage Site, and I agree with magazine over here. You're going to need to get, I mean, modern day stuff to preserve an ancient site. Get bloggers. Maybe put in a live cam. People would like the live camera thing. That's a great well, idea yeah. to build an online audience um, to maybe live. raise money to get the LIDAR done. A live cam would be done. would be nice to have. I'm afraid the way things are right now, it would be stolen. <laughs> ah, good, good but, but good. Yes. yes. That's what I thought about at the time. But it would be nice. It'd be nice totally to characterize the entire thing. Yes. yes. And uh, find out what else it does, what else the shadows do. Mm -hmm. And the reason I try to speculate about how it was used is so that real archaeologists, people who have been educated in the culture of ancient times, might mm -hmm. say, okay, that fills a gap we didn't know about. Yes. We always wondered yes. about such a thing. Maybe this was. Now, I, I did send a book, a copy of the book, to a respected Indian archaeologist in Chicago. And uh, he said he'd received it. He had had time to review it. The last mm -hmm. time I communicating with him. He was in Peru and asked him to please go by and take a look himself because I would like to uh, do a uh, professional paper about it. I mean, uh, I'm not an archaeologist, but From I do someone have in the field. I do have a doctorate in engineering. So that ought to have been some kind of this credential business, you know. Right. But uh, right. I would like for real archaeologists to take a look at it, see where I'm right, see where I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh I would, have, I would want them to go and argue with those shadows. Though, so that maybe, <laughs> yes, they're well, going to be. I, I think having someone, you know, from the the academia world, would to write a paper. I think would be beneficial. I think it would then have a little bit more credibility with the government because it's me. Even if it's someone, of, you know, in Peru who does it, well, that, would, they, uh, that they revere. I was hoping. Yeah. I was in contact with one archaeologist in Peru, but uh, he he broke off contact. I think I think because of the uh, videos that we had on YouTube, I mm -hmm. I don't know why he never did answer. But uh, right, I would yeah. Somebody in Peru in Cusco there could go out there to the site. It's only half an hour away. Yes. Go out, take a look, take all the measurements you want, do everything. Mm -hmm. and I was I was extremely disappointed to start with that somebody else didn't have the book. I'd have been real happy that day if I could have gone downtown to a bookstore in Cusco and bought a great big tabletop book and said, here's all the details. Right. That would have right. been it. I wouldn't have spent untold hours of my life. Oh, but, but you uh, know, it's, it's like a double-edged sword, I think. If you bring a lot of attention to the area, then some of that attention always isn't always welcome. You get, you know, tourism sometimes brings destruction and it's not always on purpose. You do have your vandals, but then you have people, if you look at some of the ancient monuments and locations throughout the world, because I'm a world traveler, I've been to many, and sometimes they don't even allow you to take photographs. You can't touch anything because, you know, the sweat just damages. Like yeah. we, we damage things when we come in masses, unfortunately, of no fault of our own on some, you know, most cases. So you're really taking... Um, like I said, it's a, it's like a double-edged sword. You're taking a chance with it, but in the same breath, you want it to be recognized for what it is because it's very it's a very impressive site. Well, in this case, they can't touch it unless they climb up there. Now, I have been told by other people that uh, since the publicity, the the site, the video that Brian Forster put up, yeah, ancient the Inca had a clock. I checked it. It's been seen 132,000 times on YouTube. Wow. I wish wow. 1% I wish 1% of those people <laughs> buy my book. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, but I've been told that a lot of people climb up there and meditate and try to get 
Stargate portal. You know, all this, this that's, nonsense. That's a big one. That's a big one. But maybe that's what you almost got to lean towards to bring that attention, you know? Like, apparently, according to magazine, the site is a half hour away from the alleged alien attack up there. So, I don't know. <laughs> alien attack. That alien attack, I didn't see. The, I'm not reading the report. Yeah, she goes, the site is a half hour away uh, from a location that had an alleged alien attack. Oh, the so, alien I thought that was over in the Amazon in Peru where they had the. Uh, yeah, the I don't. I don't know, but maybe <laughs> maybe you just have to be kind of including it <laughs> a few a few the, things uh, to bring a different culture over to look at it, and then the people come, then they protect it because they're not going to want to see it get destroyed. That alien attack I read about the face stealers over in the Amazon jungle that was weird. Uh, yeah. Now yeah. that's another. Okay. In my entire life, I've been interested in strange things. My my grandmother, uh, maternal grandmother, told me all the, the ghost stories of the family, and uh, she, you know she claimed we were Cherokee, and uh, and she so she had all these stories about things, and she believed it all. And my 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 mother didn't did not want her to tell me, but she did anyhow. Right. But I, I grew up in, in Little Rock, Arkansas, and that's the birthplace of General Douglas MacArthur, right? Where, World War II guy, and uh, his homestead is now MacArthur Park, not the one in the song, but MacArthur Park, and it had a natural history museum inside, and I used to visit it quite a bit. My dad ran a baseball team, and I was more interested in the museum, so in the same spot, so I went inside and looked at the, all the natural history stuff they had there, and they had, uh, Arkansas has got a lot of mounds, a lot of Indian mm. stuff, and they had all kinds of things in there, and they uh, I got extremely interested in that as a little kid with my grandmother's stories about weird things happening. And then I saw all these weird monuments and, and uh, carvings and pottery and things inside the museum. I got interested in it. In town, I lived across the street from the elementary school I attended. And we had a lot of trees. It was a little forest there for playground. Mm -hmm. And we found arrowheads. We just found arrowheads right across the street from the oh. house. Right. So as a kid, I used to wonder, you know, who made this? When? And I, nobody really had answers to that. You know, mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of years ago, there were people out here carving arrowheads or using arrowheads. So I always got fascinated. Um, yes. Back in the 50s, television was different. And it used to be on a cartoons. They had a program called What in the World? I remember that. <laughs> you remember that one? Reruns, yes. I, I do. I remember. I'm 30 years older. Anyhow. <laughs> and you, they, they would put an artifact out and then a lot of smoke around it, clear it off. And they said, what is this? And the experts were trying to figure it out. Well, I used to watch that religiously. Wow. And I got to where I could just about pick it out if it was Olmec or if it was Aztec or if it was some other culture. Right. right. And, that, and that was this. Now, at one point in my life, I've always been interested in rockets, spaceships, UFOs, everything weird. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be an archaeologist. I mean, but one of my heroes growing up was a guy named Roy Chapman Andrews, no relation, who uh, did discoveries in China in the Gobi Desert, right. paleontologist. And uh, so getting ready to choose a career, I looked at archaeology in high school. Okay, archaeologists, you have to get a doctorate in archaeology. Yes to do anything, and you have to get grants, and you have to put up with academia. And I said, well, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Astronomy was next. Okay, I didn't want to work nights alone. <laughs> and so science, yeah, science or engineering. And when I got ready to take the first test to become a co-op student at White Sands Missile Range, I decided engineering uh, because that was one of the things that was available. Mm -hmm. That's how my career wound up. So I wound up working around working around rockets and stuff. My first job was as a missile tracker at White Sands Missile Range at 18 years old. And you get to watch hundreds of missile flights. That was, that was fun. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, <laughs> now, while I was there, on a different topic from Peru, September the 26th, 1960, that time I had, by the way, I had a, I had a week old son by that time, my first child. Oh. Yeah. 
uh, there was a sighting, UFO sighting in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Uh, a couple of cops saw a green light up with a mesa next to a golf course. Mm-hmm. They went up to see it and they saw some big green, dripping green flight, uh, light uh, flames and taking off across the mountains. Hmm. And wow. uh, security guards at White Sands Missile Range over there at Holloman Air Force Base saw it. And they said it was probably a meteorite. Now, I might only have been a young engineer, but I didn't think meteorites took off from the ground. No. <laughs> no. Now, fortunately, uh, John Greenwald here of the Black Vault sent me a, a copy of the report. I mentioned it to him a few months ago, and he found it and sent it to me. And the CIA had looked into it and had said it was uh, probably a reentry of the Soviet satellite again. I don't think so. They no. don't go. Around. No, but they they do spin a good tale. <laughs> but no. during that during that time, I got to meet Doctor J. Allen Heineck. He was a UFO investigator. I didn't know he was a UFO investigator. Wow. I was I was friends with Doctor Clyde Tombaugh, the guy who discovered Pluto. He That's was professor. Cool. He was a professor at our school, and uh, he introduced Doctor Heineck as a balloon astronomer. Mm-hmm. I wish I wish I had known because I would have told him about that site. But anyhow. And I met a bunch of UFO people over the years. I became a uh, consultant for APRO, Area Phenomena Research Organization. I, in 1967, I brought Jim and Cora Lorenzen over to New Mexico State University mm-hmm. to make a presentation about UFOs. And I became a consultant for them. Nice. Later, I worked with Walt Andrews of uh, UFON and became a uh, mechanical engineering consultant for them, hoping that someday if the government found ufos they would invite some of us to come in and look at them but right sure they, <laughs> like right. they didn't do it we're still they, fighting for that <laughs> oh, right. yeah, the, yeah the, the most important discovery in human history and they won't tell us about it that bothers me a lot right right but yeah back on more mundane things like uh, the ancient civilization that created this this sculpture uh right right and, and- i have Ultimate respect for whoever did it, the, the concept of it, the execution of it. I would love to know how it fit into their uh, to society. And that's why I hope real right. or real archaeologists will look at it and tell us mm-hmm. how it right. fit. I mean, I put it this way: when re- I read a whole bunch, I bought a lot of whole whole bunch of books on uh, Indian uh, astronomy. Mm-hmm. I've got a couple dozen here. I bought, and one of them here they they talked about. Around Cusco, when the Inca took over, you know, Inca of their day were like kind of like the Russians of our day. They just went in and took over what they wanted to and mm-hmm. incorporated, just took it over. Right. And uh, when they took over Cusco, they erected, they were, they worshiped the sun. Yeah. You know, the, the people in the, the sticks out there worshiped the moon mostly, but the Inca worshiped the sun. They put these great big uh, columns around Cusco. And they, the Spanish uh, chronicler talked about it, said at the solstice, you could be there, hundreds of people would turn out, and you could see where the shadows were. And uh, the Spaniards, of course, tore them down and used the stones for other things. But, uh, so I, I consider finding a solstice in Cusco be like Big Ben clock in London. Everybody, thousands of people can see it. Right. Yep, there it is. But yeah. this Kia Rubiak out here in the sticks, that's more like your grandfather clock in the hallway. It is. You don't have, you don't have a lot of people to see it, but it's still important. Yes. That's yeah, the difference. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, yeah. uh, if you've been all over those ruins down there around Cusco, all over Peru. But it's, oh, hidden, I, it's hidden in plain sight, pretty much. Well, it's yeah. Off the I, beaten track, you know. Well, it's on the way. It's in the Sacred Valley. It's just. Uh, right. About a mile and a half off of the main drag, and those roads were probably built uh, where the Inca went. Nice. I don't, I don't know why it was ignored all this time, but I do know that as soon as you call it, well, it was a ritual thing. Mm-hmm. Your your brains turn off. So a ritual thing. That's that's interesting. How so? Well, one guy claimed that oh, it's an exact replica of a feminine shrine in Egypt. Well, good. Huh. Show us. Show us. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Show us the work. <laughs> yeah. 
that would be fantastic if you could find something in Egypt of this, the same age. Yes. Yes. So anyhow, I'm putting it out there. I'm hoping the book sells because mm -hmm. I want I want lots and lots of people to be interested in this thing because there might be an equal genius out there who reads this thing and says, I know what that's for. I know how to do it. Right. Right. You can I, write the book. Or, Tell hey, I've, I've seen something similar. Um, Magazine Washington, did you name it the Shadow Machine? And it goes on to say, shadows bring to mind duality, the dark half as above, so below type of stuff. Well, Soli Sombre, you know, Sun and Shadows. It's a shadow machine. It produces shadows uh, according to the programming. It's a three-dimensional solid program, if you right. wish. Yeah. It, it's software. It's software in the Stone Age, if you want to say. You know. Yes. It, 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 it's built. It's there. Mm -hmm. uh, it speaks for itself. And the uh, limestone I, is local? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that stone there, that huge stone you saw, I think, is... If the entire outcropping is probably 100 feet, 150 feet wide, right. it's just an outcropping to limestone. Right. And like I said, I think they chose the site because of convenience. Yes. Convenience of the flat stone to carve in, the stone to sit on, mm -hmm. the fact that there's a stream behind it that meant they could build, they could live there, somebody could live there. There's water, flowing water. And, uh, right. Right. And there, there might be more to it. Like I said, just please look at it. I know there's another Inca site called Tipan, which they're on the other side of Cusco, where they bring they brought water and it still works underground two pipes from a mile and a half away, and it still flows. Mm -hmm. That was right. beautiful hydraulic engineering. Right. And that Suwedi stone I keep talking that that is a uh, to me a, th a three dimensional representation of uh, a teaching machine. Probably a documenting machine. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a scale model of a lot of uh, hydraulic works in Peru. And, uh, but like I said, that's another subject. I want to, I want to write a book about it, but I don't have enough no, measurements. Yet, we spent a couple of days there. Yeah, it, it'll come. <laughs> but she goes, yeah, shadows, light, mirrors, water, reflections. You know, because you thought maybe they may have had a bowl with water. So it seems to be something that could potentially be working on different levels, not just, you know, the shadow, but the lights. Yeah, it, could, years it be could be. Uh, one photograph there, you see there's a crack, and it points toward uh, one of those markings. And like I said, if you put a long bowl of water in there, and the sun shines a certain time, it will give a probably a ray of light sign. It, it, but like I said, right. I just didn't have the time, time right. or inclination to go ahead and uh, do that. There's so many, so many mm -hmm. nuances to this that you can spend your entire life on. I wanted to hurry well, up and get the information out to other people who work on it. Yeah, you know, let, let's face it. A lot of, of these ancient cultures had, you know, they built monuments. And we in the modern times think, oh, it's this big spectacular thing that does this and that. But meanwhile, it's an elaborate sundial. <laughs> you, you know, and and you yeah. see examples of it all over the planet, and here you've got this very elaborate device that is essentially that sort of a timekeeping machine. Because you're right, you know, to go back to the ancient times, it was all about the solstices. This what they they followed the stars, or the and they followed, you know, the sun. And if you missed the boat, you didn't eat that year. That's it. You know? and, uh, so it, successful societies were able to use that information. The unsuccessful ones died. Mm -hmm. Na nature. Um, uh, uh, Tamara uh, says it would be good to know what building was destroyed uh, that was with that shadow machine. Do you have any idea? No. Uh, there's a uh, downhill from there. It's probably 30 by 40 feet square, mm -hmm. but there are only a couple of courses of uh, uh, rectangular stone left there. I don't know what it was. Right, right. But it was it was of the same kind of megalithic construction as the real nice 
stuff. It was not Ica. You know, the Ica, you can look at Machu Picchu, for example. Right. In Machu Picchu, there are beautifully carved and finished megalithic stones. And above those, you see stones that the Ica piled on with mortar. Mm -hmm. And so more than likely that Mm -hmm. that the building was not Ica, which kind of suggests that perhaps the key Rubioc itself was not Ica. Now, according to the uh, archaeologists that I did read, they said that the name Kia Rubioc doesn't appear anywhere. This is what the locals called it because it was it looked like the moon to them, looked mm-hmm. like a crescent moon. So right. they called it the moonstone, but nobody right. knows what it was originally called or right. what language it was in. Right. So it, uh, like I said, I, I get a lot of people interested in it, let other people look at it and work with it. And let's see what else we can find out. Let's make it a ongoing. It's so perspective. fascinating. Yeah. Um, well, I would, I would love, I would love it if they could actually find something similar elsewhere, and you could just sort of connect the dots. It would probably answer so many other questions for you. For example, all the pyramids throughout the world tells us that there were advanced cultures that made their way somewhere to 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 build these exact same monuments just different styles but at the end of the day they're pretty much the same monuments yeah i was all the hinges all the mounds you know like the similarities i thought it was fascinating when i was there i've been to both the great pyramid giza and the pyramid of the sun at tiwanaku yeah tiwakon rather uh, yes yes and they both have the same base they both have the base dimension is the same for both of those now. Wow, but really? <laughs> I wonder why is that? I mean, I doubt if they were built at the same time. But is that reflective of some ancient system of measurement or, or what? Right. I mean, it goes on. And on. I, I was on Ancient Aliens once. Uh, they wanted me to uh, come and talk about the use of mica on the, great, on the uh, Pyramid of uh, the Sun. Right. And uh, the way they <laughs> the way they put it to me, uh, we want you to talk about mica. Was it used for spaceships landing on that pyramid, or was it used for uh, protection against radiation on this pyramid? I said, look, I'm not even going to <clears throat> dignify that with any kind of answer. Right. Let's just call, let's call the whole thing off. Oh, we can't call it off because we've already bought tickets for you. You got to fly out to Denver and uh, be interviewed. <laughs> Mm. I was down in Texas at the time, and uh, right, that's a tough one. So I, I wouldn't do it. I was going to call it off, but <clears throat> they said, "Well, what, what kind of answers? What kind of questions will you answer?" So I gave them some. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> they uh, they still ask other questions, but I, I refuse to say those words. Right, like Brian, like Brian told me, if if you refuse to say ancient aliens on there, they, you'll never be on again. <laughs> and so he was probably right because I was only had that one hour of interview they've played it they split it up into two different parts two different times right (laughs) you don't have creative control and you have to put your you know yeah i I think there were ancient aliens i think there are present-day aliens i just don't think i don't think they have a lot to do with this uh as my my old acquaintance uh, stanton friedman one time said when they asked him why why don't the aliens come out and land on the white house lawn and talk to us he said, I don't know. I don't try to talk to the squirrels in my backyard. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Well, I talk this, to squirrels in the backyard. But, yeah. this, this whole thing about the aliens is... Uh, I, 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 want to know, I want to know what they are. But like I, I've written several things in the UFO encyclopedia and mm-hmm. other books saying that when we finally do find out, if we ever do, the truth about UFOs and aliens... First off, it might not be worth knowing. Mm-hmm. Or we might not want to know it, or right. we might wish we didn't know it. <laughs> right, right, right. It's one of those double-edged sword things, right? But, I and, mean, uh, you've been to some of these ancient monuments. I, like I said, I, I've, I've traveled the world myself to phenomenal ancient places. We know there was definitely cultures here long before us. We're not the first kick of the can at the planet. You know, we're probably the fourth or fifth with respect to civilizations. They found a lot of out of place artifacts that 
leave us scratching our heads. We, you know, pre ice age, um, you know, civilizations, we can look at some of the hieroglyphs and petroglyphs and some of the ancient structures. We know there's something to it for sure, but you know, can we, or will we assume, well, we can make a lot of assumptions, but can we prove, I guess is a better way to put it that they had a hand in any of this. I know the ancients would emulate what fascinated them or what they respected or what they feared. You know, they would emulate some of the things that they saw. We know that because we see them in petroglyphs and hieroglyphs and et cetera, et cetera. So maybe that's why people are so anxious to, to go there. You know, people want to think your discovery is a bloody Stargate because it's exciting and it's like, can you imagine? Like, people want to look at that. If you say, well, it's a sundial. Can it beam us out somewhere? <laughs> like they just they want they want that 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 mystery behind it, you know. So I I, I am a uh, hard headed engineer, and right. uh, to me, to me the first off, it's pretty to look at, and secondly, it was, it was majestic in its conception and yes. execution, and right. that's enough for me. I, I yeah, if you put all these other mystical things in there, you can't prove it. And so it, to me, it's, right. meaning, it's, to me it's, a, it's a waste of time. Right. Uh, too many New Agers that I've met over the years, and I've been meeting New Agers for 60 years now. Right. At Midwood, uh, right. looking for some sort of instant salvation. Uh, in meditation. If you want to get perfect meditation, you're going to be a Tibetan monk, and you're going to spend 50 <laughs> years alone in a damn cave. And start yourself there. Uh, you know, right. You're not going to get it by some guru from India who's going to give you a 15 minute. Right. Montreal, like I, I did that. I've done that too. Right. Uh, you know, I've well, maybe they've got to do 3D imaging to go go through that rock and see what else in and around under. You know. Well, maybe. a 3D scan can do it. I mean, you uh, somebody can set up in a day. You have to have permission, though. In fact, in Peru, you have to have permission to take professional cameras there and the number oh, wow. of the number of uh, chips you bring in to take pictures with. So I've probably violated all kinds of laws. I'll probably never go back again. Cause right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Naughty. <laughs> Naughty. Yeah. yeah. I, okay. I'm, I'm writing another novel right now okay. about what went on before. And, and part of the novel is, and part of my belief is this, you look at Gunong Padang in Indonesia my friend Lee Pennington went there a few years ago and uh, mm -hmm. did a lot of surveys and stuff and talked to this guy, Danny Hillerman, who uh, found it and who they dated parts of it back 24,000 years old. Wow. Now, let's think about it. What kind of science do we have? Our science didn't really begin until the 1600s. Right. And we had all kind of knowledge gathering before that, but there was no something that you could call science, maybe stretch it, maybe the 1500s, but until you had Newton and Leibniz and these guys, you didn't really have science. You had a lot of interested rich guys who went around and wrote neat things about animals and stuff. But So we've had only 500 years of science. Mm -hmm. What if on Indonesia, before it sank under the ocean in the Ice Age, yes, Younger Dryas, yes. what if you had an island there, you had some kind of civilization that went on for 5,000 years, it had 5,000 years of science and not 500 years. What if they were interested in uh, astronomy and geology and everything else? Mm -hmm. And they were isolated enough so they didn't have any enemies coming in like the Egyptians and Indians did, rolling over them every 100 years and right. murdering millions by the people, millions of people, or plagues or earthquakes. Mm -hmm. So if you had an island in Indonesia and maybe they got all their tribal things settled mm -hmm. the first couple thousand years, and then there were a few million people living there. And they started science. And they had did it for 5,000 years, about 500 years. Mm -hmm. Then some catastrophe hit, hits like the Younger Dryas or a meteor or some plague or a huge tsunami or something. Mm -hmm. That's what I had in mind when I was in Peru back in 2012 when I looked at those stones at Saksue Mon and everything. I, those stones looked to me, the weathering and the the hugeness of them. Yes. This thing must be 10 or 15,000 years old. 
And based on that, that stimulated another thing. So I sat down at the airport in Lima and started writing a story, which we'll talk about another time. Yeah, fiction. Yeah. Called yeah. Thought. What's going to be left of our civilization in 15,000 years? Right. Not, not much. Not right. much unless we, get, unless we can get off the planet. Right. But, uh, but anyhow. That's coming up November, people, just so you know. <laughs> Tune in. <laughs> I know. I have a copy of that cover of the book on the back here. Yeah. But anyhow, the. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You imagine these things, and I want to keep it on a human basis. I mean, yes. right? We, if we do meet these aliens that they're talking about, or the UFOs, the UAPs, right there, mm -hmm. that's going to be the most important event in human history since we crawl out of the sea. I think mm -hmm. because it all depends on whether near to us or very, they're a billion years ahead of us. Then again, talking to squirrels might be uh, too much. I might be talking to might be talking to bacteria. You know, we might be the bacteria to them. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's whatever they yeah whatever, whatever they want to do, whatever they want to do will be done. Period. That's it. Right. And of course, my first thing is, I used to say when I used to give UFO talks many years ago, I said, when I meet the aliens, I want to get their franchise for technology for earth. I want to be in the middle end to sell technology to earth. Right. Can you, can you imagine if we meet them and they're humanoid and we can look at them and they'll talk to us, they can get to the moon in five minutes. Space, that be grand? Well, yeah, SpaceX stock right. would be, what happens to the stock market? What happens to the stock market when they have a, a fusion generator the size of your iPhone and we don't need electricity anymore. We don't need, I imagine you're a South Sea Islander mm -hmm. in the 1940s and you've never seen a, a person from a civilized world. Mm -hmm. A great big ship pulls up in your harbor. Right. All of a sudden, uh, every social construct that you have, every belief system you have, everything you have is totally out the window. Right. Uh, you, you know, now I think in our case, depending on how bad it is, the, the adjustment is, I think the religion people, religious people in the world will have no problem with this. I keep hearing all this arrogant things. Well, religions will die off if we meet aliens. No. Every religion on earth, every imam and rabbi and preacher and pope and everybody else will make accommodations to it. The people who won't be able to make accommodations to it are the most educated and brilliant scientists that we have right now. Because all of a sudden, everything that they know is worthless. If these people are a million years ahead of us, Dr. Heineck one time said, there will be a science of the year 3000. To those scientists looking back, the science of the year 2000 will appear to be closer to the year 1000 than mm -hmm. to theirs. Right. So if you, if you brought Archimedes, most brilliant guy in the past, up to the present, mm -hmm. he would appreciate our mechanical things. You start talking to him about electronics and stuff. And he would have, he might go into shock, you know, because you would have to start, you'd have to start in the first grade with him. He might learn fast, but you'd, you'd have to, everything you ever do about things, mm -hmm. it's changed. And that might be, the engineers, we engineers won't have any problem with it because, mm -hmm. hey, you got alien stuff, let us have it. Let us play with it. Let's go, you know. Right. I, doubt, I doubt if we'd be able to reverse engineer everything because, and that might be one of the problems that they've come across if they have reverse engineered over the years. Yes, I believe if you, so. You take a uh, one of our uh, big things in the news that you take one of our F-16 aircraft, which are old to us, and put it back in 1890 mm -hmm. and tell them to uh, reverse engineer it. Right. They would know what it does, but they wouldn't have any clue about where to begin. And wh where do you begin to uh, study a semiconductor Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, every time you tried to test it with the equipment they had in 1890, Tesla or even Tesla, they blow it apart. And mm -hmm. There would be no way to reverse engineer something that advanced. Right, right. Now, as a UFO guy over the years, I've heard all these stories before about about things, and I never mm -hmm. believed any of. I didn't believe that we ever retrieved and reverse engineered anything because there's 
we have no evidence of it. Now, if somebody, if Lockheed came out with an anti gravity machine tomorrow, then I'd say, okay, maybe there is something to it. But well, it doesn't mean they're going to put it right out there for the world to see. A lot of it is national security, I believe, as well. You don't want the other guy or, you know, the, the enemy, so to speak. Because let's face it, especially during Cold War times, you don't want anybody knowing what you've got. <laughs> you know, there's that yeah, but, argument as well. But it would be nice if we had it, to have yes. a fleet. We have a fleet of those that's still around the world. And yes. Hey, guys, give up. Let's be in peace because you don't have a... You don't have a chance. Look what we got. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you never want to be, you know, you want the poker face. You never want to tip your hand either. I believe anything is possible. You know, I mean, I've, like I say, you know, I've also, I've just traveled so much, you know, throughout the world. I've seen pretty amazing things that the ancient people have done. I know that a lot of information has been suppressed. I know we've been conditioned in some ways um, as to, you know, what the, the powers that be decide we as a society are either ready to know or should know on a need to know basis. And we don't need to know, <laughs> you know, there's there's that whole whole spectrum of different things. Um, and I, I don't think some they're necessarily ready to rewrite some parts of history. They just want to leave it alone. And academia, you know, they're they're very. No, this is this is how it is, because we have a formula. And there's a formula in everything in life, let's face it, you know. I like to try to have an open mind, but I'm also very logical. So that's my logical brain sometimes gets in the way of the open mind, and sometimes it's the other way around, you know. Yeah, we're all that way, yeah. So, you know, you'd like to think, I mean, I, I know there's something greater, that's for sure. I've, I've, I've had sightings myself. I'm an experiencer. It's like, okay, you know, it's, it's there. But I don't, in the same respect, even with all these amazing experiences, I don't necessarily lean to the fact that we have a space fleet up there. <laughs> oh, no, I, Do you, you know what I mean? Like, I know, yeah. yeah. We, yeah uh, you know. I saw, I saw Bud, I was 10 years old. In rural Arkansas, and uh, something shot across the sky. It looked like the moon to me. I thought it was the moon for, for instance. And it was sinusoidal. It wasn't in a straight line like a meteor. Right. It was like right. this. Right. And it almost literally scared the out of me, you know. And uh, right. right. I thought it was the moon for so. And then yeah. there have been other instances of weird things. And I, uh, on the Paranormal stuff. I've, I've written. If you add up everything together, I've probably read over 500 articles and books and everything else together on everything else. And a lot of I've been about paranormal. I'm interested. To me, it's all one thing. There's not right. science and magic and paranormal and everything. It's it's all one spectrum. Magic and the paranormal are things we don't understand yet. Now, I have to agree with somebody who said what's that they use the word queer to be strange. The universe is not only queer than we imagine, it's queerer than we can imagine. Right. So it might be beyond us. But hey, right. until we get to that until we get to that point, it's we're doing pretty good so far. Right. Uh, right. I've had ar these arguments with people before that who are devout atheists who uh, I say, you know, I have no problem with you believing whatever you want to, but you don't right. you can't come out and say that you know that there is no God. You're a total atheist because yeah. When you say that, you're you're telling me that you, one little dinky person, this one little dinky planet, one little dinky galaxy in the universe, right? Are, aware, are, are you're aware of every relationship, every being, every creation, every event that's a, occurred and occurring in this whole universe and all the multiple universes beside right. us? And right. I don't believe. It. I say you don't know much of anything, and so for yourself, no problem. Do whatever you want, but don't yeah. tell. You can't make a proclamation that that's the way it is because you look at the pictures that the JWST has taken out there mm -hmm. of a trillion galaxies, and some right. of them are 13, 14 billion years, light years away. Right. If your philosophy and your religion doesn't take all that into account, mm -hmm. then to me, it doesn't count. Somehow, right. whatever your belief system is, has got to accommodate the fact that the universe is pretty damn big. Like, Kurt Vonnegut said, uh, the universe is pretty big, 
might be the biggest, you know. So, uh, it, and and I have the same kind of disregard for people who make proclamations in their field of interest. Mm-hmm. I wrote an article for Analog Magazine mm-hmm. a few years ago called "Limits of Belief." Now, getting to Egypt and ancient archaeology and everything. Yes, I really respect people who do this. I mean, mm-hmm. I really want. Archaeologists. I respect somebody who spent 30 years figuring out all the cases and uses of the hieroglyphic grammar, you know. That's hard work. <laughs> and in cuneiform, and also, I'm so happy that people do that. Mm-hmm. But you can't take that and, and go off into an area you, you don't know about. Chris Dunn and I were touring the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Oh, he, spectacular. He, showed, he shows me this glass case that shows all the tools that they've used. Working, you start off with bird bones mm-hmm. and little chisels and stones and things like that, and diorite stones. And like Chris says, now they've had a they had continuous three thousand years of civilization. Mm-hmm. Their tools never got any better. That's all they were able to do. Mm-hmm. Give me a break. Right. And his shop, his shop in Indiana, the shop he worked at in England. In five years, the guys working in those shops with a hand, they came up with different tools themselves. Yes. So in three thousand years. That's not going to literally. There's, there's going to be some kind of evolution, is what you're saying. <laughs> it's not going. It's not literally not going to cut it. Right. Not a, not a right. And so, so obviously, what they're showing us there is not true. So, when an archaeologist, unfortunately, a lot of people have never built anything with their hands, or designed mm-hmm. something, or had something built, or done things, and. I was interviewed for the show uh, Revelation of the Pyramids. It's, right. I had about 15 seconds on there. During that show, mm-hmm. I told the guys what I want to do. I'm begging the professional archaeologist and anthropologist, I guess it matters too, to invite in other people, people who work with the hands, the engineers, the technicians, the artisans, okay. the sculptors, the, the pottery makers, mm-hmm. bring those people in give their opinion because most of you people have an academic background and you've never built anything. Right. You've never built anything. You've never had to put anything into a factory or have other people build it or any of that stuff. I mean, I've had people during different talks say, well, we couldn't build the pyramids today if we had to. Well, let me ask you something. There's a 20 story building downtown. Could you build that? <laughs> Yeah. You don't know how to do that? No, you don't know everything th- right. about that. Right. So so somebody who knew how to do it did it. Right, right. Just because you don't know how to do it doesn't mean that aliens did it. Well, it's, it's just like saying, you know, you have your carpenters. You have your your stonemasons. You know, right. like there are people who specialize in different things, and they do just that. That's all they do, and that's what that's what they know. You know, uh, at the end of the day, you know, we're a really tiny little grain of sand on a really, really big beach. And it's very hard to say definitively anything other than just, you know, speculating. Because I, I think until we actually die and, and well, we can be up, it, up, up there and the, be all knowing and say, okay, that's how they did it. <laughs> you know, right now we're limited by time, by space, by our physical being, by the things that we're, we know or we're allowed to know or by experience or lack of, you know, it's all, a, it's a pretty fascinating ride, I guess yeah. is the best way to put it. It's, you know, it's a pretty fascinating ride and all you can do is keep educating yourself and like yourself, you went out, you, you saw something that fascinated you you looked at it and you decided, I'm going to try to dissect this thing. I want to figure it out. What's it all about? And I think if, you know, more people had that drive or the ability to just take one, I mean, this is pretty grandiose on the big, you know, scale of things. It's a, it's a pretty fascinating discovery. But you can apply that to different aspects of your life. Yes. Yeah. And the, uh... Well, it's an engineering education, I guess. Engineering education. Uh, I always envied those people I knew in college who uh, were taking liberal arts courses, humanities courses. Right. So I, I took as many as my engineering curriculum book would allow me. Every year they they liberalized it, so I took 
sociology and psychology and world history and world literature and political science and stuff. Things that my uh, engineering friends, most of them didn't want to take. They said, oh, that's stuff." I said, well, why do you take them? I said, well, first off, to me, it's easy. There's not any intellectual challenge in any of those courses. And believe me, I was able to blow people away in those courses. There's nothing to it. And why? Because in engineering, <clears throat> in engineering's problems, there's typically only one answer. Mm -hmm. There's a right answer. Everything else is wrong. In political science, psychology, sociology, literature, all these things, freshman comp and everything else, your opinion means something. And as you can see right here for the last hour or so, I can BS with, with just about anybody if you're not talking about sports. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and your opinion meant something in political science. My political science teacher was a uh, hard leftist. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't know it at the time, but I was libertarian. I didn't know it. That's what I was. But uh, mm -hmm. we argued on every single thing, yet he had to give me an A in a class because I blew away every one of his tests because he was honest about it. Right. You know, we disagreed, right. but he, he respected the answer. So right. It was so nice to be able I always wonder what it would be like to take a course, a, a degree in a field where your opinion meant something because engineering is hard and fast. Yes. It, it meant yes. nothing. Now you got to be creative, right? But but it's logical. And the limits of uh, what's possible, and, uh, right? So that's why I was an engineer, not a scientist, uh, right? But it paid off <laughs> because, because you 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 know you've discovered this amazing location and you've theorized. You know, I, I mean, a lot of these these type of places, ancient places a lot of it is theory but that's that's half the fun i think if you had all the answers and you know the journey would pretty much come to an end and that's never any fun it's great when you can keep going so how do people find your book how can they okay. find your book? <clears throat> it's on amazon oh okay. uh, hopefully uh, amazon works in the other countries that way too i guess there are different amazons it only comes in the, the paperback. We were not able to do a Kindle version, unfortunately. The uh, publisher I deal with was not able to do a Kindle version. Okay. So it's it's there. The main thing is I invite everybody to read it, analyze it, and come up with your own stuff and get in contact with me. My, uh, I can be found on Facebook easily. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to hear from anybody who has opinions of it. If anybody buys it on Amazon, I would appreciate a, a, <clears throat> a review because Amazon helps you when you get a lot of reviews. But I want to get the word out. I want to get the word out to anybody who wants to look at it, especially professionals who might have other takes on it and other ways to look at it. And, uh, uh, I will make a point of going to get uh, the Amazon link and I will post it in the show description. So Great. this way here, people can just click on it and go. And um, I will make sure that all the YouTube channels have it. Uh, and this way here, there it is. Nice and easy. So do you have anything coming up? Do you have any other uh, shows coming up that you'd like to promote or any events? There's a uh, an event in October called the, uh, gosh, Nature Artifact Preservation Society, AAPS, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Okay. And uh, a lot of people are going to be presenting talk. I'm scheduled to present a talk on this there myself. Oh, that's great. So uh, can people, will they be able to get copies of your book from there? Or is it strictly as Amazon? Do you have any that you'll be able to, to sell and sign? Yeah. There should oh. be some, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another thing I'd like to mention, it's, it's not to do with this, but it's to do with our whole subject. Okay. New age, new age and everything. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Catherine Asaro, who's a uh, singer and a ballet person and also a scientist, mm -hmm. it, uh, she sings a song that I wrote called Ancient Ages, and that's on YouTube. Okay. And what's your YouTube channel? It's just, I don't know, let's look on YouTube and look at okay. 
a sorrow, ancient ages. Okay. It's a music. It's a song that I wrote, and uh, she's adapted it and sings it. And it's if you're interested in Celtic or pagan music, you might be interested in that too. Oh yeah, absolutely. I like to perform it because she does a good job of it. And it's there's another the story behind that song that I wrote was a uh, another whole me another whole program to talk about it. But basically, it was a a vision, a revelation that came in the middle of a storm, a dark and stormy night. Believe it or not, <laughs> right? <laughs> and and uh, she does a good job of it, but yeah, the the words came to me like automatic writing, and the music did too. Oh, it's beautiful. So, uh, Catherine Asaro, Ancient Ages, and I always appreciate any comments about that. In other words, I'm interested in all kind of weird stuff. No, I mean, I, I, weird I, knew, I, was, I was never, I was never going to be the world's greatest scientist or engineer. But as like Charles Fort said, if you look in the dark corners of the room <laughs> where the light doesn't show, you might find things wiggling around in there and there might be something interesting. And so I I decided as a young kid, that's that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look in the dark corners and put it, try to put some light on them. And, uh, and this is one of them, the Peru thing. I, I'm proud of it because uh, – and there might be other places to look, you know. I, I, I think it's a good start. You know, I, I think it's it's going to be a journey where you'll be able to keep exploring and hopefully people listening to all of these shows that you do will be able to help you find some answers and you never know. Maybe they'll find a connection for you somewhere else. Maybe they'll be able to look at it and say, hey, what about this? This fresh eyes. Right. What about this theory? What about this theory? Anything that keeps you forging ahead with it. I yeah. think it's fantastic. Keep the interest alive. Keep it going. Well, thank you for having me on here about that. Oh, I think that. It is a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, and I'll I will shoot you an email. And of course, you're back on on November 27th, I believe it is. Let me just double check. Um, no, what am I saying? It's the 23rd. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're going to be okay. talking about the Thaw series, and that's yeah. going to be pretty exciting as well. Yeah, hopefully by that time, they, those books will be out in paperback, too. Oh, not wonderful. Just, not just Kindle, yeah. I love All right. it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for, for joining me tonight. And, um, and I know Amelia just regrets that she couldn't be here, but family emergency. So, oh, no, <laughs> yes. But thank you again, and and I will be in touch, of course. And I will send you all the links to the audio and the video version of the show. Okay, great. Thank you very much, and thank you all the people out there who are watching or listening too. Always, that's what we do it for. <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Arlen. Okay. Thank, thank you. Good night. Good, good night. Bye bye. Bye now. Well, everybody, we've come to the end of another fantastic segment. Uh, definitely something we we haven't you know talked about. This is an exciting discovery and hopefully somebody out there will be able to add their own twist to the piece of the puzzle. So we didn't get to do our, our, you know, sponsor ID, uh, part way into the show, just, you know, full into conversation. So extra big thank you to Folgers coffee for sponsoring tonight's show and every night show. We couldn't do it without you. We're so appreciative. Big thank you to Dr. Snick, Justin Snicker, Big thank you to Steve McGinnis. We appreciate you all so much. Whichever platform you're listening to, please like, subscribe, share, uh, whatever it takes. We appreciate you so very much for doing so. Tomorrow night, super laid back night, we welcome the return of Preston Dennett. Yay! He's just, you know, like family friend and frequent flyer. So he's going to be talking about his latest book, which was just released. And it's one of, well, we're going to be one of the first to be able to debut it. And it's called Humanoids and High Strangeness. So basically, he's got 20 new original unpublished accounts of people who have had face-to-face -face contact with a variety of humanoid ETs. So he's going to talk about all kinds of that, you know, different types of, of, of races and like angels and nature spirits and just phenomenal stuff. I can't believe we're excited. So anyway, everybody, thank you. And uh, thank you. You're so sweet, Chris. Thank you. But again, tried to get to everybody. Just had a lot of comments coming in 
from, you know, all the Facebooks and the other YouTube channels as well. So we see some new faces as well as our regulars. So again, love and appreciate you all. You make the show that much better. So we shall see you all tomorrow night. Good night.